Sweet, welcome. Uh, thank you everyone for coming uh, to this particular session. The session next door going on about space uh, uh, and SRE in space, uh, which also sounds particularly interesting. So the fact that you've chosen to forego space to learn about a data structure, uh, <laughs> you folks are definitely uh, dedicated. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time today uh, dissecting the uh, LSM tree, which is pretty ubiquitous. You probably do use it, especially if you use something like Netflix as uh, behind the scenes. Um, but I don't think it gets much appreciation. Now, you might be saying, a talk about data structures. Am I at the right conference? You know, Usenix uh, runs a whole heap of conferences, um, a whole heap of really good conferences, and some of them have uh, much better appetite for database-level uh, talks. Um, but my philosophy is that the world of site reliability engineering, uh, you know, there's a lot of theories today, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, you know, talking about the uh, principles around, around SRE and things like that, uh, you know, and so I feel like I have to get on stage and, and also do a hot take on what I think the, the principles around SRE are, uh, you know. The SRE space has grown a lot in, uh, in, in the last couple of years, um, and many folks are well-versed. There's plenty of talks on incident management, monitoring, cloud systems, and tooling, and uh, you know, a whole heap of the uh, 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 SRE bits. And I think what doesn't get as much appreciation is the other side, the, the practical side. Um, so I really appreciate SRECon putting on this like, core principles, core fundamentals track, um, and also getting a chance to speak on it again. Thank you so much. Uh, and the general premise of this talk is to to sort of talk about how you can make better decisions in application design, uh, because that is part of our role as SREs, is to help product level and product engineering teams make better decisions so that uh, they have better understanding of how their applications run on the hardware uh, and systems that you provide. So, before we dive too deep, uh, a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Sahel, um, and, and I'm one of the staff engineers at a company called Monzo. Um, and I work uh, in the platform group at Monzo, uh, where we provide all of the underlying infrastructure, libraries, and tooling so that engineers can really focus on building the bank and not have to worry about their underlying infrastructure. Um, I, I like to describe it as like the magic of Heroku. Uh, that's the experience that we aim to emulate, uh, but in an opinionated manner, uh, which makes it easy to get through a, a regular regulatory environment. Now, uh, for those who haven't heard about Monzo, uh, we um, are a, a fully licensed and regulated bank in the UK, um, and we also have a presence in the US. We don't have physical branches, we have a very nice mobile app, some very nice cards, um, and we essentially have a full banking suite via the app. Uh, the philosophy being is that you, know, you don't need to go into a branch to do all of the things that you expect from your bank. A bank that you actually think you'd be delighted to, 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 have, uh, to put your money in. Put your money in. Um, for the folks in the EU, unfortunately, we're not quite here yet. Uh, but if you use like Bunk or N26, uh, we're very, very similar. But I think I, I argue that we have the nicer looking cards. Um, the, the hot coral one is definitely my favorite. Now, uh, I'm going to show a little bit of code on my slides, uh, which is a rarity in this conference, it seems, uh, a little bit. Uh, you're more than welcome to modify, inspire, distribute. Uh, you know, uh, if you need a license, it's all MIT. Uh, the link is up there, and uh, you know, I'm sure the slides will be online uh, very soon. Um, but you know, there's, a, there's a condition. I get to absolve all liability. I don't want to be a contributing factor in your incident reports, but if you do have an incident, please submit a talk next year, because I'll be very interested in visiting it. Um, and if you do need a scapegoat, um, I generated an AI panda. Um, so please uh, you know, uh, blame the AI panda. Um, I believe their name was called DevOps. Um, now, distributed systems and database systems are really, really hard. Uh, there are many, many battle-tested systems. You know, there'll be a few names that you recognize in that particular list. Uh, and there's this very wonderful fellow called uh, Kyle Kingsbury who runs a very uh, interesting uh, website uh, and, and, a, and a test suite called the Jepson Test, uh, where they expose buggy behavior in, in, in database-level applications. And many of these behaviors can lead to inconsistency consistency and data loss uh, within, your, uh, within your database, which is scary. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, give it a read. Um, I do not recommend reading it before bedtime, because it may give you nightmares. Uh, so yeah, I'm not responsible for that either. 
Now, I'm a very, very visual learner, so you're going to see a lot of diagrams in the talk, uh, and here is first. Uh, so if you've ever uh, you know, uh, been to like a computer science course or uh, opened an algorithms book, uh, you will have come across a data structure which looks a little bit like this. This is called a B-tree. Uh, and if you're very familiar with a binary tree, this is going to look very, very similar, uh, where you've got sorting of elements, and then you can traverse the tree in order. Nothing too fascinating. Uh, there's lots of boxes here uh, over many slides. Uh, and like a lot of them represent numbers. Imagine that you have a primary key index um, uh, for within your within your database, and all of these point to records. Uh, so you know you have a, an index with database two, which points to a, a particular record. Uh, and essentially, a, a you know a B tree is like an index over those records. It's a key value lookup mechanism. Now. Similar to a binary tree, doing a search is essentially very similar to doing a binary search. You start at the head and make your way down uh, to the node you're trying to find. So imagine we're looking for the 90, you essentially traverse the tree. Uh, and you know, uh, one of the big things within, within these particular systems is that you can find a record in this tree in, a, like, you know, I guess what they say, log n comparisons, uh, which is pretty good going. Um, and imagine all of these things corresponded to data records and the numbers are the identifier for that record. You're going to want an efficient representation so that you don't have to sequentially scroll through the list. And you know, that's why these, these data structures uh, exist. Now, the, these, uh, these data structures are fundamentally used as index implementations in many popular databases. Hopefully, there's some names that you recognize there. You know, if you define an index using the create index uh, SQL uh, command, uh, you know, it'll almost certainly be using a B tree under the hood uh, when represented as, you know, within your database system and on, you know, on disk storage. Now, Say you want to insert an item. Uh, so for example, you know, you've got those, those three elements at, at the bottom there in the orange. Uh, and we want to add a few more records uh, that you know, sort of fall into that section of the tree. So we've added a few more items there, uh, 86 and 87, uh, colored in the light orange, which is all fine and dandy. However, the tree is a little bit imbalanced uh, when it comes to the leaf nodes. You know, you've got a few that have got two, one, and you've got this, this uh, bit of the subtree that's got five elements, and it's a little bit imbalanced and not nice looking. Uh, so yeah, we, let's see if we can uh, correct that a little. Uh, the, one of the good properties about B-trees is that they are self-balancing. Uh, so they will juggle items around to maintain an optimum distribution. And many implementations of these will attempt to keep the height of the tree, uh, so essentially how deep it goes, uh, you know, the number of connections from top to bottom as minimal as possible. Essentially, that affects performance. Uh, you don't want to be doing, you don't want to end up in a tree which starts from the very top and has all of the elements going to the very bottom, because that is essentially no better than a sequential scan. Um, so we've done a little bit of rebalancing, fancy animation. Uh, and so all of the items in the red there have had to be reshuffled uh, at, so that we have more even distribution of our, of our, of our leaf nodes. Uh, so now we no longer have uh, uh, you know, five leaf nodes under, under one connection. It all looks evenly balanced again. Now, um, you know, uh, some of you folks may be too young to recognize uh, what, what one of these looks like. This is a spinning hard drive, uh, you know, uh, very similar to like a CD-ROM. Uh, you know, if you have one of those thick hard drives, what it looks like underneath with a head and, you know, the thing spins around very, very fast. Um, and yeah, like, you know, the, the head moves around and, and things like that. So those, those B-tree data structures uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, are, are written to the hard drive as opposed to being in, in RAM. Uh, uh, very typically, uh, and what that means is that the B tree can grow um, as your data grows without the fear of uh, running out of memory and, and things like that. And as an optimization, you can of course uh, store the data in memory. Um, however, your data is written over time, uh, and your B tree isn't going to live within a contiguous place on the hard drive. You don't want your B tree to be you know, splattered all over your hard drive. But that's what happens uh, because your, your data structure grows over time. So that means that every time you need to do a change or a lookup in your B tree, uh, you know, uh, if you remember our search example, we had four comparisons. You end up waiting for that thing to move around really, really quickly uh, to the right position on disk where that, where that next record exists. Uh, and it's a couple of milliseconds. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's slow uh, to, to get to the place where, where that bit might be located. Located. Uh, and you know, you essentially run into the fundamentals of physics. You know, the head can only move so fast, the splatter.
platter can o uh, the, the platter can only spin so fast. Um, so imagine you need to do that a couple times, and you scale that up faster and faster and faster. You know, you end up with with comparisons that are tens of milliseconds, uh, and this is before you've done any compute. It's essentially I/O, um, and even on block storage like EBS, I guess you know you don't see these things anymore unless you're running your own data center. Uh, you know, even on block storage like like EBS, if you're using like AWS or uh, you know, you might need four or five I/O operations uh, or IOPS uh, to be able to do that uh, within your your particular system. Whereas in a more optimized system, you might be able to do that in one I/O operation. And that kind of stuff matters because with systems like EBS, you have some amount of balance that you can you can you can use and burst into. And then once you go beyond that, you have to wait for your buffer to fill up. Now, uh, I'm not sure if folks here are, are uh, old enough to remember the days of de disk defragmentation. Uh, the general principle uh, is that uh, you know, these colored blocks would move around and just take a really, really long time. Uh, but it actually did make a difference. You know, it made your computer at least feel faster. I don't know if it you know, uh, actually made it faster. But uh, you know, uh, the general premise is that it would reorganize your data to be uh, better optimized for uh, how it would would be laid out on disk, essentially, uh, for especially for spinning hard drives. Uh, lay, the general principle being lay the data out in a linear manner so that you could take the best advantage of the hardware. Uh, you know, it's why, why defragmenting made your computer feel faster. Now, even in the age of solid-state drives, uh, you know, uh, SSDs, uh, SSDs are much faster at reading sequential data than doing random access. So the, the physics has still held true. Uh, the above chart is from uh, 2009, uh, but the premise of optimizing for sequential reads and writes is very much uh, in, in practice today. Even if you get the fastest SSDs, I think, like, you know, I don't know if Optane is still like top of the range from, from Intel, you know, sequential reads, you can read far, far, far larger amounts of data than uh, random access. Uh, you know, on, on many SSDs, you can read one kilobyte or four kilobytes uh, within a single I.O. operation. But if all your data is scattered all over the place, you can ha you're gonna be having lots of operations, even if you're trying to read a couple kilobytes uh, before you even manage to read a couple kilobytes. Uh, and essentially, that fundamentally reduces the performance of your application or database. Now, let's take it back into the practical uh, before we dive deep again into, into the diagrams. If you've got something which is like append only, you know, something that's based on an event stream, you want to ingest, you know, you know, if you if you caught Emil's to, uh, Emil's talk uh, a little bit earlier, he talked about the concept of having innovation tokens and you know choosing boring technology, and that's something I fundamentally agree with. Um, but also, one of the reasons why uh, uh, you know um, a lot of the like you know no SQL and, and systems have uh, become very popular is that a lot of folks bought into the marketing uh, that these these teams uh, th these companies uh, sort of expose. Like you know these things are going to be massively scalable uh, without. Really Really understanding the, the theoretical. They're going to be scalable if you have an appropriate workload uh, that is suitable for those particular systems. And that's why I like giving talks like these, because we talk about those particular workloads. So I think if you take anything away, I'm not saying go and rip out your database and, and replace it with what, you know, what I'm suggesting here or uh, put my code into prod. Uh, it's more like understand the, the workloads that fit best for the kinds of systems that you're trying to run. Uh, I'm sure many of us have uh, really fun stories about a database outages, because, uh, for example, we were ingesting a lot of data, we had a table with a lot of relations, and we couldn't keep on top of the vacuum schedule, or one that uh, I think uh, comes up very often is you run out of like, transaction IDs, uh, you know, and uh, you know, your, your database stops. Uh, top tip in Postgres, you can then go into the negative, uh, which, is, which is a lot of fun, um, especially if you're expecting ID ordering. Um, and if you want to do anything like that's based on, like for example, a rolling window, keeping a rolling window of data at scale, there's a lot of really well-documented escapades on being able to do that on top of MySQL or Postgres or even SQLite. But you know, you're in the danger zone of potentially like abusing the system, and uh, you know, uh, you can be in problematic territory. Uh, and now this is specific to the data structure itself or, or the database system itself. It's about understanding where your workload fits uh, in, in relation to how those systems are, are designed. 
So hopefully I've given you a good reason to continue listening. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, log structure merge trees, or LSM trees for short. Uh, and the general premise uh, around, around these particular data structures is to make inserting and mutating your data really efficient uh, and reduce the need fundamentally for random disk operations every time. Now, this isn't a very uh, theoretical principle either. There's many database systems that have been built on this particular concept. Uh, and these, these systems tout their performance uh, or, or around large volumes of data as a very, very strong advantage. Uh, it is perfectly normal and general uh, practice to store hundreds of terabytes in these particular systems and billions, if not trillions, of rows. And they are so highly optimized uh, for, for slurping up all of this data. Uh, you know, a perfect fit for this is, is one that I showcased earlier around analytical or um, event stream-based workloads, uh, where you have to have really high ingest throughput. Um, I saw a tweet quite recently from, from, a, from a conference a couple of weeks back uh, that mentioned that Netflix has over 12 petabytes of data spread across 900 Cassandra clusters, which I can't fathom. And then I also saw that Bigtable has uh, 10 exabytes of data uh, and 5 billion requests per second at peak, uh, which is an astronomical number. Um, so yeah. Uh, hopefully that, that showcases uh, the kind of scale that, that some of these companies are building on. And they are building on fundamentally the data structures that we're going to be talking about, uh, but not the code. Uh, so let's dive a little bit into the implementation and see why this data structure works so well. Uh, so the premise behind SM trees is that they use a mixture of RAM uh, and disk to achieve its performance characteristics. The memory portion is used as an append-only write log buffer. Uh, and this is typically referred to as the mem table uh, in most implementations. Uh, and essentially, it is an append-only log, which means writing data becomes an O1 operation because you just whack your data right at the end. Uh, and it can be hyper-fast uh, at the time for, uh, of ingesting data for your application. Um, now, uh, not illustrated on the slide, but most of these come with a commit log so that if your system crashes in the middle, you can then re, uh, uh, rebuild the, the mem table again. Uh, and that is durably uh, f-synced every time you, you, you get a write. Um, which is fantastic. So let's translate this into, into some code. And you know, uh, I've written a very, very simple Python implementation here. Um, this code looks relatively simple. We're essentially appending to an in-memory list. It doesn't need to get more complex than that. Uh, but if we keep going at this rate, we're going to have the next global database, um, which is going to be fantastic. Uh, I've got a booth lined up uh, in, in the conference hall for SRECon 2023 already. Um, so the general principle is that these writes come in over time, and we buffer these up once we get to some threshold or some amount of time passes, uh, you know, asynchronously, uh, you know, we get to like five items uh, and we will choose to flush these onto disk. Um, so these items are then written to what we call an SS table file, a sorted strings table. Um, and, you know, it, it, it looks like a very fancy con concept, uh, but essentially it's all of your data stored in order on disk as one file. Uh, so that essentially means that we could do binary search of this data if we wanted to retrieve something. Um, so in this particular example, uh, the rights have, uh, a new batch of rights have come in, which we've showcased in the blue. Uh, and we've reached enough capacity again, or enough time has passed, and we flush this data onto disk. Um, and we've essentially written another file represented in the red. Now, you might be wondering, why don't we just append it to the uh, original file uh, that we have? Um, and one of the properties uh, that most implementations go with is that these SS table files are immutable. Once they're written, uh, they don't get changed. They don't change behind the scenes, which are really nice properties to have. Uh, they only get created or deleted. And we'll talk about the deletion uh, in a little bit. Um, now, this immutability is a really, really nice property. Because if you're implementing, for example, a replication-based system, or you want to like stream these things across, uh, you can validate the integrity of this data set against your peers. You can compare your SS table, the SS table of your peers. Um, and additionally, the SS table is only written once. Uh, so you know, uh, depending on your, on your file system implementation and, and your disk, uh, you can prioritize essentially writing it uh, in, in a sequential fashion. Now, there's a lot more code on the screen, uh, but it's, it's not too scary. Uh, let's take a second to, to digest it. Uh, you know, we've uh, essentially made our item class a little bit more complex. Uh, we've added a function to help us sort these items based on the particular key, uh, because we have to remember that these SS table files are sorted. Um, 
And uh, in the actual implementation of our data store, we, we have a little bit of a flush function where we say, if we reach five elements, uh, let's write a, a, a file to, to disk with all the records that were in the mem table uh, and make our mem table array uh, empty again so we don't bloat up our, our memory. Um, now, uh, I've written a very naive implementation where you know, we essentially uh, look for this check uh, as we're inserting data. But uh, one of the nice properties is that you can do this asynchronously. Um, which is, is really nice, or based on some sort of ticker. So you say you only buffer up to a minute or five items worth of writes. Now, if the data set is immutable, what happens if you want to delete an item? Now, one of the guarantees that we talked about earlier is that an SS table file doesn't change behind the scenes. Uh, now, one of the options we have is that we could delete the old SS table file um, and rewrite it, uh, taking the deletion into action so we don't write that bit of data again. But that can become prohibitively expensive, uh, especially if you want to delete a single item in, in a file that has millions of items. Uh, you're going to have to rewrite all of this data for, again, like possibly hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes of data just to delete a couple bytes of, of data, which is, is not a good trade-off. Um, and you know, whilst not specific to the data structure itself, uh, you know, if you're using these as part of uh, you know, network-based distributed systems, uh, you, know, you could have a, a scenario where a server has handled a deletion of a record by rewriting the entire file, and another server maybe didn't observe that particular operation uh, for, you know, because of a, of a network issue or a latency issue, um, and that can lead to a disagreement on what the actual active set of data is. Uh, so imagine we want to delete the, uh, the, the 83 here, uh, uh, what do we do from, from SS table file number two? How could we achieve that? Now, uh, one of the strategies that's used in, in many implementations is to write what we like to call a tombstone, uh, represented in the, in the black circle up there, uh, and we write that into the mem table. Uh, so that essentially is a marker, is an indicator that record number 83 was deleted, and we should no longer surface it if we do find it. If someone looks up the, the record number 83, uh, you know, it will find both uh, both uh, markers, uh, so you'll find the original record, and then you'll find the deletion, uh, and the deletion will take precedence. And this tombstone is also written to the SS table file when the SS table file is flushed to flushed to disk. And we have to write and persist the fact that the data has been deleted, because again, uh, you know, if the search finds the old record, uh, you know, 83, for example, we have to instruct our server to throw that record away because the tombstone takes precedence. Now, most implementations, uh, when you're writing these mem tables and SS tables, also store a timestamp uh, for when, when a particular mutation operation came in. So for example, when you write some data or update some data, it's also associated with a, with a timestamp, which helps in conflict resolution. So for example, uh, here we can see that the tombstone comes logically uh, after the original write of record number 83. Uh, record number 83 is at uh, you know, time plus 7, and the tombstone came, comes in at t plus 30. Um, so the tombstone takes precedence uh, over, the, over the original write. So if another write for record number 83 came in afterwards, after the tombstone has been written, the tombstone doesn't then accidentally uh, mark that data as deleted as well. Uh, so the order of operations is pretty important, and we store that alongside our data set. Now, these tombstones don't come for free. Uh, they do take up valuable disk space um, and you know, make querying data a little bit more complex because you know, you're, you're going to be surfacing you know, data that you've written, and then it's been deleted, and it's been written again, and it's been deleted again. And you, you know, uh, the, the logic behind this can get uh, like, you know, quite, quite complex. But they are an evil necessity for maintaining some of our invariants around how these uh, files are handled. Uh, and one of the big problems uh, is that if you don't do tombstones correctly, you can can lead, you know, that can lead to data that you thought was definitively deleted being resurrected and becoming part of the active data set. Uh, and that can really confuse your application. Uh, that makes for a very, very fun incident to reconcile. Uh, so, updating an item uh, it essentially has the same trade-offs as deleting an item. But instead of writing a tombstone record, we just add a new variant of that value again. So, for example, we have our record number 83, and we've got uh, 83 tick, uh, you know, marked by the, uh, by the apostrophe. Uh, that gets written to a new SS table, and that takes precedence because of uh, timestamp-based conflict resolution. The old variant is still lingering around on disk, and you know, depending on how you do the, the, the searches, uh, you know, that record will still be surfaced, but the new record will, will take precedence because it will have a larger timestamp. 
So back to some code. Uh, let's update our implementation of our of our database. Um, so for for brevity, I've put the like insert and update and delete functions as as we've uh, you know showcased them in the diagram. Um, and you know we've got our timestamp all being propagated, and we've got a marker to to signal whether this is a deletion or whether we're adding uh, adding a new new value, which symbolizes whether whether data is being deleted or not. So, uh, you know, our database implementation is coming along very nicely. We have the ability to insert and modify and delete data, which is fantastic. Uh, but, you know, a database wouldn't be complete if we had no way to retrieve data again. Uh, you know, we don't want to send our data into the ether never to be seen again. Um, now, since all of our items are scattered across files, uh, how do we go about reading them? You know, it'd be really nice if we had an index, uh, but then, you know, we've now come full circle. <laughs> um, but we do know that these files exist. Um, uh, and you know we could keep track of what files are on the file system. Uh, so one of the very naive approaches, if you're looking for a particular uh, element in the, in the set, is just to do a binary search over over all of the active files. Uh, we mustn't forget that there might be some data that's still being uh, that's still in like the, the holding pen, uh, you know, uh, waiting to be written to disk. So we need to search that that data set too. Uh, it is still part of the active data set. It just doesn't reside as a file yet. So uh, let's add that into our implementation. Uh, you know, I've written a little bit of code here uh, to naively read all of the SS table files. Um, I got a little bit lazy. I didn't implement binary search. Uh, so instead, I'm just going through it line by line. Um, you know, it's not efficient, but it's going to work for this demo. Um, now, th there is a particular optimization that you can have uh, that I've literally just spotted, uh, which is uh, you could probably uh, you know, take advantage of the fact that your SS table is sorted by key. So once you bypass the key that you're looking for, you can break early, um, which, which would be uh, pretty, pretty useful. Uh, but tying all of this together, uh, you know, essentially we can build a full search function. This code will be online later. I won't go through it line by line. But essentially, we, we take all of our records that match our particular key and combine it with all the records that we've seen in our mem table. We sort all of our records by the timestamp that we've, uh, we've seen them in. Uh, and the one that is the most recent uh, value with the largest timestamp wins. Uh, yes, uh, you know, last timestamp wins conflicts res uh, conflict resolution. Uh, that's in the if block uh, that you can see at the, at the bottom there. Um, and you know, if we find nothing in, in all of the files that we search, um, we uh, essentially return the fact that we found nothing. So uh, by this point, we've got a working database implementation. You can read data, you can search for data, you can uh, create, write, and, and, and write delete markers as well. Uh, so we're ready to push to prod, right? Um, now, uh, if you remember some of the code that was uh, implementing the, the SS table lookup, we were iterating through every file to see if the key exists. Um, and even if we were doing binary search, it's still a penalty. Uh, you know, if we're searching for record number 83, for example, uh, you know, can't we just look at that particular file because we know that it doesn't, uh, you know, do we have some way of knowing that it doesn't exist in, in the other files? Um, and again, you know, it would be really nice to have an index, but it sort of defeats the purpose of, of this entire system if you have to have an indexing system on top of what is arguably an indexing system. So many implementations uh, turn to uh, Bloom filters. Uh, and Bloom filters uh, give us a good proxy for determining whether an item is potentially in, in, in a set of data or definitely not in a set. Uh, and that's a really interesting property uh, of this particular data structure. The, the premise behind a Bloom filter is that it is uh, quite simple to understand and really space efficient uh, because they are a fixed size. So rather than keeping a copy of every key in the index uh, to definitively say whether something is in there or not, uh, you know, we can make this Bloom filter uh, size and uh, use probability uh, to determine whether something is potentially in there or definitely not. Um, so you can represent many different values within a small amount of space, a, a small bit array. Um, so let's take this particular example. Our bit array starts with all zeros. When we insert an item, uh, you know, we turn it into the binary representation, and we set all of its uh, relevant bits uh, to one in the bit array. So we've taken our representation of 90 and put it in binary and set those bits to one. When we, exert, when we insert the next item, in, in this particular case a seven, uh, we set those bits uh, to, to one as well. 
And then we can do lookups uh, based on this. Uh, so we can turn the, the thing that we want to look up into a binary representation and see if all of the bits are positive in our bit array uh, in their respective positions. So if we want to see if 255 is in our bit array, well, some of the bits are positive, but not all of them. So we can definitively be sure that 255 is not in the bit array. Quite a nice property. Um, but for example, even though we didn't insert the number two, uh, all of its bits uh, are, are positive. All of its positive bits are positive in our bit array. So the number two may potentially be in our set. And you know, that's, that, again, that's something that we'll need to contend with. Same with the number 83, for example. Uh, it is possibly in the set because all of its bits also correspond to one in our, in our bit array. Uh, but you know, didn't we only insert 90 and 7? Why are these things uh, you know, also considered as being potentially in the set? And that's the whole probabilistic nature. Uh, it's very similar to like, you know, caching systems. Uh, you know, if you've got a good hashing function uh, and a large enough uh, Bloom filter, uh, you can predict the item being in a set with a high probability and something that you can tune over time. Uh, and you can have some implementations have Bloom filters that are like, you know, a couple megabytes large, uh, but you know, have a very, very high probability uh, of, of determining whether an item is, is in the set, uh, which is a really nice property to have. So, Bloom filters to the rescue. Uh, and in many representations, these Bloom filters are written as a file on disk, uh, and they're loaded into RAM when your database system starts. So you can do these lookups very, very cheaply. And since they are space efficient, you don't end up using a ton of RAM, which, uh, you know, and, and it saves you from ongoing disk access. Uh, if you remember the triangle of latency, uh, you know, your RAM lookups are going to be far, far, far cheaper than, than uh, a disk lookup, uh, which ultimately does improve performance. Um, so I'm not going to go into the implementation of BloomFilter. There's many of them out there. There's libraries for most programming languages, so you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Now, the last bit I want to touch on is uh, compaction. Uh, so as our writes come in, we're writing all of these files. Uh, but there's going to be a point where you know, we've accumulated a lot of craft. Uh, you know, if we're, for example, writing some data and then overwriting that data and then deleting that data and then writing a new record again, you know, you're going to be accumulating a lot of old garbage that you can afford to, to delete. Uh, so you know, we're storing all of these old records that, and deletions uh, that have been superseded. Uh, and all of that is taking up space. and you know. Uh, our hard drives are going to start complaining that you know they're going to they're going to run out of space. Uh, and also, uh, one thing we need to contend with is that the number of files keeps growing and growing and growing. Uh, you know, many file systems, you know, especially a lot of the older ones, don't like having tens and thousands, tens of thousands of files. Uh, uh, you know, and yeah, having all of them accumulate is not very pleasant, especially when you do ls and the thing hangs uh, for for a couple seconds. Um, this is where compaction comes into play. Uh, compaction essentially takes a bunch of these SS table files and, and rewrites them, uh, combining things together, uh, combining elements together, resorting, and deleting old craft uh, to essentially end up with a larger SS table file. So we can take all of our candidate SS tables. Here we're taking one, two, and three uh, that we want to compact together. Uh, and we deduplicate items, expire out old data, and then smush it all together into a new file. The, the uh, new SS table compacted file is a cleaner representation of all of its, uh, all of its parents. So we can remove all of the old uh, uh, files and just keep around this compacted one. Um, now, earlier on, I talked about like, file-based immutability. So the deletion of, a, of an SS table file, uh, you know, uh, you know, depending on uh, how, you, how, you, how you understood it, you know, doesn't that fall under the like, immutability guarantee? Um, now, essentially, you can essentially do a presence check of a particular file. So you know, these files are typically written with a sequential identifier. Uh, and once the file disappears, it's no longer part of your, your, your database system. So the guarantee is only for a, a file won't change once it's been written. Um, now, this is important because you know, this maintenance operation of compaction runs alongside your, your live database, your, your operation database. It's something that you do as you're, as you're ingesting more and more data, in, in, and the two are going hand in hand. You know, in an ideal world, we don't want to take our database system offline uh, to essentially run these maintenance operations. And that is the trade-off, right? That is the trade-off of you know, this, this kind of system with LSM trees and, and SS tables. When you write your data, 
it will continue to be rewritten. That is the cost of doing business uh, over time because you have to run these maintenance operations, things like compaction, you have to maintain bloom tables, uh, bloom filters. Uh, you, know, you have to run these maintenance cycles. You prioritize fast inserts for, uh, and, and updates and mutations for your application at the time that your application is ingesting them for uh, you know, uh, background operations running throughout the lifetime of your, of your application. This might be ideal for you if you have like a seasonal pattern or some sort of like, you know, day-night load pattern where during the night uh, you know, your, your database systems are, are idle. You can schedule these maintenance operations to happen during your, your lull times, uh, which, which is ideal because then you're using the compute that would otherwise remain unused. Now, I showed quite a, quite a simple representation of, of compaction, but there's different strategies that you can employ uh, depending on what kind of data you have and what your workload looks like. Uh, you know, size-tiered compaction uh, you know, aims to merge SS tables together based on size. Uh, you know, uh, we don't want to do a bunch of work to append a really small SS table to a really large one. Uh, so you know, we take uh, these files of similar size and smush them together into larger and larger ones. Uh, there's also leveled compaction, which is an alternative uh, where you you know, you can have a fixed size uh, per SS table file, but essentially trying to minimize the spread of a particular key, uh, which is a, a really nice property to have when you're reading that data again. Uh, but again, coming with a heavy write penalty because you've got to split all of this data up as it's being, uh, as it's being uh, compacted. Um, a particular interesting one is the time window at the bottom there. Uh, so for example, if you have some sort of time series data or you want to maintain a sliding window, uh, you can uh, group things in, in all or, uh, in order of their uh, insertion timestamp and keep time windows of files. Um, so essentially, if you want to keep a rolling window of data, you can essentially delete the old files on the file system uh, uh, you know, uh, beyond the, the window that has, been uh, that has been expired. So for example, if you're only keeping 24 hours worth of data and you have a bunch of files that were, you know, were written 48 hours ago, you can just RMRF them. Uh, and you know, they're no longer part of your active data set uh, and free up a whole bunch of space, uh, which uh, you know, makes a lot of sense if you're maintaining, for example, an analytical workload or you know, maintaining some logs for uh, you know, a fixed duration. So we've come a, covered a bunch of depth in this talk. Um, now, fortunately, you don't have to use my terrible code. Uh, there's a lot of really good libraries out there uh, that uh, you, can, you can rely on. Uh, whilst I was writing this talk, I actually came across the uh, uh, SQLite 4, uh, which has a C-based implementation uh, that you can use, which implements all of the things and comes with you know, the battle-tested you know, uh, SQLite uh, you know, reliable benchmarking and, and testing um, uh, frameworks uh, that are utilizing uh, all of these functions uh, behind the scenes. And you can embed this into your applications. It's really well explained, really well documented. Definitely suggest giving it a read if you're interested. Um, I personally really, really liked it. So we've covered a lot. Let's quickly summarize. Um, the systems that store your data uh, are some of the most critical. And you know, if you're not running these things at like a really high volume or high scale, you can definitely choose to use boring technology. But you know, part of our repertoire is to have a, a, a large enough toolbox and understand those, those things uh, so that we know what, what systems to suggest and what things we are worth looking into depending on our workload. And so I think it's interesting to, to, to learn these sorts of things. Uh, you know, I'm sure many, many of us have, a, have an incident story you know, around a particular workload change in, in a relational data store, uh, causing saturation of your database, query plans changing, and, and things like that because of statistics. This is an alternative which can have much more reliable performance, uh, but there are other trade-offs as well. Uh, so yeah, do some research up front uh, and think about the relationship of your data and the hardware that you want to provision and the scale of throughput that you want to, uh, you want to support. Um, these data structures don't need to be scary. Uh, there are plenty of, of papers out there that are hundreds of pages long, and there's many, many textbooks in, in academia that uh, I personally find it a little bit dry, uh, and yeah, that sort of puts me off uh, reading about this sort of stuff. But hopefully, this doesn't need to be scary. Uh, there's plenty of uh, visual representation out there, and these are battle-tested systems that are used in industry. This isn't just like you know, a theoretical, theoretical concept. Uh, and if you don't want to re-implement this yourself, uh, you know, there's plenty of battle-tested systems out there, uh, or you could use something like Bigtable, which uh, you know Google will uh, be very happy to sell you. 
lastly, uh, your high-performance workload is going to look very different to my high-performance workload. Uh, and these systems come with a lot of knobs uh, and uh, things that you can, you can, you can tweak. Uh, so you know, we talked about compaction strategies and, and the size of your bloom filters. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of things. I don't know if you folks have played with you know, Java garbage collection, but it's like you know, infinite knobs that you can, you can fiddle around with, which is great because there's lots of different permutations, uh, uh, which can get you out of trouble, but also terrible because uh, there's no uh, documented practice on uh, exactly what knobs you need to tweak, especially in the middle of a fire. Uh, so that can be a good thing or a bad thing, uh, depending on how deeply uh, you understand these different configurable parameters. But getting a good understanding of the data structures helps you make much more informed decisions. And with that, thank you for listening.